Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be chapter 3, The Scepter and the Birthright. And I'm reading the book, Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright by J.H. Allen. The book is over 100 years old, not subject to copyright. And, excuse me, if you've never read the book of Genesis, well, hey, this is a good opportunity to do just that. This book ties in with a previous series that I did, um, Abraham, it's a playlist on Abraham, the covenants of Abraham. This ties right into that, if you're interested. All right, so let's con let's keep uh, let's get started on chapter three, the scepter and the birthright. Simply to show the fact that there is in biblical history that which is styled the scepter, and also that there is something which is designated as the birthright. We quote the following: "The scepter shall not depart from Judah, etc." Genesis. 49.10, for Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him comes the chief ruler, prince, but the birthright is Joseph's. 1 Chronicles 5.2, that the scepter blessings, privileges, and promises pertain to Judah, from whom comes the royal family of Israel's race, is well known, and its import somewhat fully comprehended in the realm of light and knowledge as disseminated through Christendom. But that which is called the birthright has not in the past been understood at all, and as yet is understood but by the few. And the very few who have written on themes which involve the birthright have assumed that their readers were as bright as they and have written concerning the birthright without, without explaining what it is. Hence, the reader is compelled to receive their use and application of the word without knowing it to be correct. When we say that the word birthright implies that which comes by right of birth or as an inheritance, all will agree with us. But just what special inheritance is referred to as that which is declared in the above text to be the right of Joseph. Few will understand until the matter is explained. Hence, we give the following. In the first covenant, which the Lord made with Abraham, there are two distinct features insofar as concerning his children. First, a multiplicity of a multiplicity of seed, also known as children, as involved in the following. I will make the exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations, nations of thee. Second, a royal line, the promise of which is given as follows. Kings shall come out of thee. Hence these covenant promises and blessings, which have been given him direct from the Lord, become the lawful heritage of Abraham. This heritage, which was given from God to a human being, to a human being seems to have in it both a human and a divine right. The human right being that a son of the heritage holder makes succeed the father and become the lawful possessor of the inheritance. The divine right being that of choice among the legal prosperity of the heritage holder. After this heritage was given, Isaac was the first heir in the line of succession, and he was also the one whom the Lord had chosen as the inheritor of that which had been given to his father. Not only Isaac, but of six other lawful sons, who were the children of Keturah, his second wife. Notwithstanding this fact, 
the divine record declares that he gave all his possessions to Isaac, the son of Sarah. And that's recorded in Genesis 25, 5. Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. Isaac became the heir because he was the firstborn among the lawful, lawful sons of Abraham. Hence, these possessions came to him at the right of the firstborn, or by right of birth, i.e., as a birthright. And if Isaac was heir to all that Abraham ha had, then aside from all else, which may have come into his possession, he was most certainly heir of that God-given heritage, the covenants of promise, which contain these two distinct features. A multitude of people and a royal line. Esau, the son of Isaac, the brother of Jacob, having been born first, for he was the elder of twins, was next in the line of succession, and being the elder or firstborn, came into possession of the birthright. Thus, he had a birthright at his disposal, but instead of keeping it and allowing it to, to become the property of his firstborn son, he undervalued it. Uh, Bob's note here. He didn't just undervalued it. The Bible declares that he despised or hated his birthright. The gift of God, Esau, despised. He hated it greatly. And I cover that in the uh, Why God Hated Esau study. Uh, let's see. Thus he had a birthright at his disposal, but instead of keeping it and allowing it in turn to become the property of his firstborn son, he undervalued it and sold it to his brother Jacob, who, being the younger, could not have acquired it by the right of birth. The right of Esau to sell his birthright was never, has never been questioned. His wisdom in selling it may well be questioned. The fact that Jacob, who became anxious to obtain that birthright, felt that he must not only make the purchase from Esau its lawful owner, but also knew that he must deceive their father in order that he might secure it from him. The accompanying blessing is proof that the birthright was the lawful inheritance of Esau. Bob's note here. His mother, if you read the book of Genesis, it was their mother that wanted Jacob to have the birthright and um, not Esau. Esau had thrown away his heritage with the Hittite Canaanite women. So, and everybody blames Jacob, but hey, it was his mother. And you can read about that in the book of Genesis, if you're interested. So let's continue reading. Moreover, when Jacob went in, to un, uh, went in unto Isaac in the disguise, when he and his mother, which he and his mother had devised, he went in, uh, he went with a lie on his lips and said to his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. But Isaac was distrustful. The hands felt all right, but the voice aroused dis suspicion. So the blind father asked, Art thou my very son Esau? Again, Jacob answered in the affirmative. What was he after? That which belonged to the firstborn. What did he get? That which belonged to the firstborn. He had not only bought it from the firstborn himself, but also had deluded the father into bestowing upon him the blessing which made the purchase secure from the human side. For when Isaac found that Jacob had secured the blessing from him by subtlety, he could not revoke it. The word blessing seems to be the word which attaches itself to the receiver and inheritor to even these covenant promises which pertain wholly to earthly things. For God had said to Abraham, In blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thee. It is also recorded that God blessed Isaac, saying, I will bless thee, and I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars. 
Esau's sad cry was exceedingly bitter over his di disappointment when he found that Jacob had supplanted him. But Isaac was compelled to say to him, I have blessed him, Jacob, and he shall be blessed. So it is recorded. And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and said to him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Unlike what Esau did, Esau married daughters of Canaan. He said, Arise, go to Padanaram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. And God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful, multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. And I will give thee the blessings, the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee. That is in Genesis 28, 1 through 4. Thus we see that this blessing was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and carries with it the promise of a numerous posterity. Also that the blessing of Abraham was given to Jacob by his father Isaac, who was the direct inheritor of the Abrahamic covenant uh, heritage, and that while Isaac, in fact, gave it to Jacob, he intended it for Esau, his firstborn son, to whom it belonged by right of birth. If it belonged to him because he was the firstborn, then it was his birthright. And since he sold his birthright to Jacob, who thus became its possessor, Jacob, and not Esau, must become, must become the father of that promised multitude of people, which is contained in the birthright, i.e. the covenant promise of Abraham. In truth, Esau could justly say, Is he not rightly named Jacob, supplanter? For he has supplanted me these two times. Uh, Bob's notes, a supplanter is kind of like a tricker, trickery. You know, someone that does trickery. So He took away my birthright, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. Although Jacob had received from his father the most coveted blessing, which carried with it the inheritance of the birthright promises, he was dissatisfied and seemed to hold these blessings as insecure until they had been ratified to him directly by the blessing of God. Having secured them by fraud, he knew that he was holding them under the protest of both his father and his outraged brother. So much from the human side. On the divine side, God intended that Jacob should have the birthright for, as we already, as we have already shown, he chose Jacob in preference to Esau before they were born. God chose Jacob in preference to Esau before they were born. Had Jacob trusted God, he would have placed him in possession of the birthright in a perfectly honorable way. But he, in distrust, took matters into his own hands and gained possession of it by wicked conniving. Well, I disagree. It was because of this that he had more trouble to secure the blessing of God upon his possession of this inheritance than had his predecessors. And though he wrestled for it with the angel all the night long, he did not secure it until he had first confessed his name, which was expressive to his character, to be Jacob, i.e. supplanter. Then it was that God bestowed the blessing, took away that reproachful name, and gave him a new name, an untainted one, even Israel, the meaning of which is, as a prince thou hast prevailed with God. Prince with God, rules with God, you get the idea. The next legal inheritor of the birthright was Reuben, the firstborn son of Jacob and Leah, his first wife. But he, like Esau, lost it. And Joseph, the firstborn son of Rachel, the second and best loved wife of Jacob, succeeded his father in the possession of it. But that 
we are right in saying that the firstborn is the legal inheritor is evident that the fact that Reuben, the firstborn son of Jacob, is declared to have been heir to the birthright, this is made clear in the biblical account of the entertainment which was given by Joseph to his brethren when they came into Egypt the second time to buy food and brought Benjamin with them. For when the feast was ready, and Joseph, who had not yet revealed to them the fact that he was their brother, gave the word set on bread, it is said of the servants, who it seems had previously been instructed that, they sat before him the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth, and the men marveled one at another. Genesis 43, 33. Uh, he doesn't make this real clear, so let me explain this real quick. When Joseph was sold into Egypt and became the what second or third ruler of Egypt, um, he had his brethren come and he set them down at a table and he placed them, their plates and their settings, their seating in order of their birth from the oldest to the youngest at the table. I mean, they must have thought, uh, what's going on here? You know? So uh, that's why they were marveling. I mean, here it is. You got 11 kids. I mean, what's the chances of getting 11 kids uh, birth order settings at the table correct? You know, they must have, <laughs> they must have had a, you know, like, wow, dude, what's going on here? All right, let's continue reading. The fact that Reuben was the firstborn and possessor of the birthright and the cause of his losing it are set forth in connection with the declaration that the birthright had been given to Joseph as follows. Now the sons of Reuben, for he was the firstborn, but for, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, and the genealogy of Joseph's sons is not to be reckoned after the birthright. For Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him is the chief ruler, but the birthright is Joseph's. The sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, were, etc., etc. 1 Chronicles 5, 1 through 3. If our readers were to know why this act should have caused Reuben to forfeit his birthright, they must be able to read between the lines. We are only at liberty to say that after, uh, after that act, if either Reuben or his probable firstborn had come into possession of the Israelites' birthright, the Lord could not have declared as he did concerning Israel, I planted thee a noble vine, holy a right seed. Um, Bob's note here. By the way, if you don't know it, Reuben, Reuben did one of uh, his father's concubines, which was kind of like a second or, th or third, fourth wife. So, you know, the father should have been looking around that uh, his son was very, very interested in the females and should have found him a wife. So instead he went into unto one of his father's wives, concubines, whatever you want to call it. And I'm not sure he forced her. I'm not so sure. You know, maybe, maybe she um, found the young kid attractive. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not saying that's true. I'm just throwing that out there. You know, because it doesn't say that he raped her. You know, there's a lot of things in the Bible that mm, we're not 100% sure. And that's something I'm definitely not 100% sure. All right. To Isaac and to Israel, God had confirmed the covenants of promise in their entirety, including in the confirmation, the promise of the land, a multiplicity of seed, the one seed or the messianic covenant, and a royal line. But you will note from the scriptures just quoted that the promise of a royal line, which as the 
sacred story proceeds is clearly shown to contain the messianic promise had been separated from the birthright and given to Judah, the fourth son of Jacob and Leah, while the birthright fell to Joseph. This individual separation of the scepter and the birthright took place just previous to the death of Jacob, who had these blessings at his disposal, not, however, as his own self-will or human judgment might suggest, but only as God should direct. For the history of the people involved is a divine work from start to finish, and its ultimate object is the glory of God and the vindication of his word. The call of Abraham and the giving of the promises to him were supernatural. For God had appeared unto and talked with him. The production of Isaac was also supernatural. No human possibility was there, but the possibility of faith was there and it prevailed. The conception and the birth of Jacob and Esau were also supernatural, for there were two nations, two distinct races. Uh, Bob's note here. This guy says that one was a white child and the other a red one. Well, I don't know about you, but I've seen children born who were Caucasian who were red. And he says uh, they are, one's Caucasian and one's Arabic in one womb. The word Arab means mixed, like mongrel. And Esau married two Hittite Canaanite women, and he also married um, one of Ishmael's daughters. Ishmael was from an Egyptian woman. So he had at least three wives. So I don't know if this is, I, I don't believe that. These, these kids were twins. I think Esau was just as genetically pure as uh, Jacob, but he threw away his birthright. He threw away his uh, genetics by marrying the, into the Canaanite Hittite line. He threw it away. And what can I tell you? So I guess technically his children were Arabs. Uh, Bob's note here again, hey, listen, I think I think a lot of the Arabs, uh, especially the Saudis, I bet you they are from Ishmael and Esau, the merging of the two lines, because Esau married one of Ishmael's daughters. So I suspect they are, and they probably intermarried with the Canaanites. I don't know. So that's the end of Bob's note here. All right, let's continue reading. The conception of the birth of Jacob and Esau were also supernatural, for there were two nations, two distinct races, a white child and a red one, Caucasian and Arabic, in one womb, and the manner of their birth was so supernaturally manipulated, manipulated that... As they struggled in the womb, Jacob held Esau's heel, and thus they were born, the very manner of which, as we hope to show, in one of the most striking types in all the Word of God, and yet none of these events are any more supernatural, nor attended with any greater manifest power of God, nor is his will any more clearly manifest in them, than is the transfer of the scepter and the birthright by dying Jacob to Judah and to Joseph. At the time of Jacob's death, all Israel was in Egypt living in the land of Goshen. When it was reported to Joseph that his father was dying, he took with him his two sons and hastened to the bedside of the dying patriarch. But when Joseph and his sons were ushered into the presence of the dying man, it appears that supernatural strength from the one who had given him the name of Israel was given him, for although dying, it is recorded that he strengthened himself and sat up in the bed. 
Then discovering that Joseph was not alone, he asked, Who are these? To which Joseph replied, saying, These are my sons, to whom, uh, whom God hath given me in this place, i.e. Egypt. And by the way, Bob's note here, um, there was a group of people who conquered Egypt at the time. They were called the Hiskos, I think. That's how you pronounce it. H-Y-S-K-S-S-O-S. Uh, Hiskos. H-Y-S-K-S-O-S. -S Hiskos. Uh, they were Semitic, Semitic cousins of the Israelites. They were not Egyptians. So when uh, Joseph was ruler of Egypt, uh, they were ruled by a Semitic people. Uh, they were not the native Egyptians. And the native Egyptians today are probably not the same as what they were back then. Um, if you look up, Egypt was of the um, sons of Noah of Ham. You know, Ham, who was the father of Canaan, the Canaanites, the, the cursed seed line. Yeah. So they were probably, possibly the... Um, uh, Hiskos were pro possibly Japheth. I'm not sure. Now, something you should notice. Um, Joseph had married a woman uh, who was a daughter of, I think, the priest, if I remember correctly. These were, They were not heathens, I'll guarantee you. They were of pure bloodline. Otherwise, all this makes no sense. And anybody that doesn't believe that there's bloodlines in the Bible has never read Genesis, period. And God telling Israel to exterminate the Canaanites and giants with six fingers and six toes. I mean, you know, believers don't marry unbelievers and have giants with six fingers and six toes. It just doesn't work that way. If that was true, there'd be giants with six fingers and six toes running all over the place because a lot of believers marry unbelievers. So, so this is another that I'm getting ready to read his book. And I telling you it's he's his conclusions are incorrect in my opinion. After Joseph had explained to Jacob concerning his half blood Egyptian boys, Shame that this guy didn't know about the Hiskos. Joseph had married an Egyptian woman. Well, Bob's note here. Why can't we call Israel Egyptians? They lived in Egypt, right? I mean, I was born in Kentucky, but I've lived probably 90% of my life in Florida. 85, 90% of my life in Florida. Florida, does that make me a Floridian? Or am I from Kentucky? I mean, I went to the Army, Fort Knox, which is Kentucky, and one of the sergeants uh, towards the end of the training, basic training, said, hey, go talk to Bob here. He'll show you uh, around town. He was born here in Louisville. And I'm like, sergeant, um, not to be disrespectful or anything, but uh, I, I, the only thing I know about Kentucky is, is Churchill Downs, you know, the Kentucky Derby and bourbon. That's it. I mean, I said I was born here, but I haven't lived here and since I was like two, two and a half years old. I says, take you guys down to Miami. I could show you around. Yeah. So, you know, just because, you know, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but he moved and they moved to Nazareth and they lived in Galilee. So Jesus was called a Galilean. He was called a Nazarene. Um, but he was born in Bethlehem, but yet he was of the tribe of Judah, which is was Jerusalem. So is he a Galilean, a Bethlehemite, a Nazarene? Uh, you know, come on. So you know, they're they're this guy is telling you that his uh, Joseph married an Egyptian woman. Uh no. They might have conquered Egypt and they lived there. That doesn't make them racially of the uh, of of ham. And I'm not talking about pork, you know. 
uh, Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth. And Shem was the promised seed. So, all right. I hope I'm not rambling too much. After Joseph had explained to Joseph, uh, Jacob concerning his half-blood Egyptian boys, Joseph had married an Egyptian woman. Then Jacob proceeded to adopt them as his own legal sons, at which time he said, And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt before I came unto thee into Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. Genesis 48 and verse 5. But after the adoption was completed, he said to Joseph concerning the issue which should be gotten of him after them, they shall be thine, but they shall be called after their brethren in their inheritance. So it is that the tribal names of all the posterity of Joseph are dealt with both from a historic and a prophetic standpoint as Ephraim and Manasseh. Do not forget that, for upon it depends much of interest in that which is to follow. In uh, Bob's note here, Ephraim and Manasseh is going to be uh, the subject of this book to a great deal. So keep that in mind. It would appear that at the time of the adoption or prior to it, the Holy Ghost had told Jacob that Ephraim was the one which had been chosen by the Lord as the inheritor of the birthright or the blessing of the firstborn. For at that time, the name of Ephraim, the younger, was mentioned before Manasseh, the older, as also the name of Reuben, who was the real firstborn, as mentioned first when his name is coupled with that of Simeon. But the transfer of the birthright from his eldest, eldest to his younger son was not made known to Joseph until he had presented his sons before Israel for the promised blessing. Jacob had said, I will bless them. So when Joseph brought them to him and bowed himself with his face to the earth, he held Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left and Manasseh in his left hand uh, to the right hand of Jacob. Joseph, in his human calculation, was managing so as to have Manasseh, his firstborn, get the promised blessing, which was in Jacob's right hand. His thought was, if I take Manasseh in my left hand, that will bring him to the right of my father, so that even if he's blind, when he stretches forth his hands to give the blessing, his right hand will rest on the head of my firstborn son. I hope that makes sense, everybody. You know, when you're facing somebody, your left is their right, and their right is your left. So he positioned the kids the firstborn on uh, Jacob's right hand. But there's something going to, a little unusual going to happen here. But no, look, as Jacob reaches out his hands to, to lay them in blessing upon those two heads, he being under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost is guiding his hands wittingly, i.e. knowingly, he crosses them. He crosses his hands. And lets his right hand rest upon the head of Ephraim and the younger the younger brother. They were in this position when he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads and, let's, and let my name Israel be named on them in the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into multitudes in the midst of the earth these were the collective blessings which those two received together they inherited the names of the racial fathers together they are to grow into a multitude of people at this juncture joseph noticed that jacob's right hand was not resting on manasseh's head and wanted to remove it but jacob refused saying not so but, says the anxious Joseph, you have your right hand on my younger son's head. To this, Jacob replied, I know it, my son. I know it. He says, I know what I'm doing, dude. Give it a rest. Well, that's the Bob translation. How does Jacob know it? He is in a dying condition and blind. 
Ah, the spirit, the spirit of prophecy is upon him. See what follows. Joseph, uh, I'm sorry, Jacob does not remove his hands nor change their position, but with his left hand still on Manasseh's head and his right hand on Ephraim's head. All right, uh, I got disturbed there with a the phone. I hate phones. Okay. But no look as Jacob reaches out his hands to lay them in blessings upon those two heads, he being under inspiration of the Holy Ghost, is guiding his hands wittingly, i.e. knowingly crosses them and lets his right hand rest upon the head of Ephraim, the younger brother. They were in this position when he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which deemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name, Israel, be named on them in the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. These were the collective blessings which those two received. Together, they inherited the names of their racial fathers. Together, they, were, they are to grow into a multitude of people. At this juncture, Joseph notes, noticed that Jacob's right hand was not resting on Manasseh's head and wanted to remove it, but Jacob refused, saying, Not so. But, says the anxious Joseph, you have your right hand on my younger son's head. To this Jacob replied, I know it, my son, I know it. How does Jacob know it? He was in a dying condition and blind. Ah, the spirit, the spirit of prophecy is upon him. See what happens. Jacob does not remove his hands nor change their position, but with his left hand still on Manasseh's head and his right hand on Ephraim's head, he continues to prophesy. Still the prophecies are no longer collective, but special and individual. See, uh, Bob's note here. Um, there's 12 tribes and there's 12 prophecies concerning the 12 tribes. You know, people that try to tell you that the... Um, J and then the E's and then the W's uh, fulfill all the promises, um, show forth their ignorance or they're liars. I, you know, <laughs> there's 12 tribes with 12 different blessings. You've got the royal line, you've got the birthright, you've got different blessings for 12 different tribes, and the you-know-whos do not fulfill all those. Matter of fact, they fulfill virtually none of them. So either the Bible's wrong, or the you-know-whos are not who they say they are. So, all right, let's keep reading. All right, so, of Manasseh, he declares, he shall become a people, nation, and he shall be great, but truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, And thee shall Israel bless, saying, God shall make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he set me, Ephraim before Manasseh. Genesis 48, 19 and 20. So Ephraim was set before Manasseh, both nations and tribally, but they were to grow together until they became a multitude of people in the midst of the earth. Eventually, Manasseh was to become a separate nation and as such was to be a great nation. Bob's note here. That seems to, it looks to me, you know, a lot of people say that Manasseh is the U.S. Wouldn't surprise me. But Ephraim was to become a multitude of nations, or as some translated it, a company of nations. A lot of people say Ephraim was the British Empire. In either case, this is a reiteration and confirmation of the promise made to Abraham. In his tribal relations also, Ephraim was placed before his elder brother because he was elevated to the inheritance, which was forfeited by Reuben, the firstborn of Israel. This is why God declares, I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. 
and that is in Jeremiah 31 and verse 9. While the spirit of prophecy is, was, a, was still upon jo Jacob, he called all his sons together to tell them what their posterity should become in the last days. Among other prophetic utterances, of which we shall speak later, was the following concerning Judah and the scepter. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Genesis 49, 10. Whatsoever else the birthright may have contained, or if God ever did count these other blessings and promises as belonging to the birthright, one thing is certain, that is, when the birthright passed into the possession of Joseph and his sons, it was stripped bare of all else, save the oft-repeated promises which pertain to a multiplicity of seed for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hence, when it was recorded in the Chronicles that the birthright was Joseph's, it was understood that from the loins of Joseph's sons must come seed, posterity, people, yea, multitudes, nations, many nations, even races of people. This is the crucial test, since the promise of the fatherhood of many nations which was given uh, to Abraham and Jacob was inherited and sold by Esau the inherited and forfeited by Reuben but finally given to Joseph and his two sons and never revoked then we say that the crucial test not only for the faithfulness of God but also for the integrity of his word is that Joseph through Ephraim and Manasseh must of necessity become the father of those many nations which were promised to the fathers of Israel. But the fact that Joseph must become the father of those promised nations is not only the crucial test of God and his word, but it is also a test of the power and word worth, power and worth of faith. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph. Hebrews 11.21 What was that for which Joseph put forth faith when he blessed the sons of Joseph? It was that they should grow to be a multitude in the midst of the earth and eventually become that which the birthright demanded, that is, a multitude of nations. This was this birthright, the fatherhood of many nations, that Esau sold. Uh, Bob's note here. That's the end of the chapter, by the way. The end of chapter three. Uh, Bob's note here. You know, when um, Jacob Israel crossed his hands and put his right hand on the younger and his left hand on the oldest, have you ever looked at the British flag, the Union Jack? It's got the cross. Have you ever noticed that? That's, that's probably one of the that possibly may be the first time the cross is mentioned in the Bible. Isn't that interesting, huh? Yeah, the cross. You know, there's a... Uh, you know who hates the cross? Um, people in the Middle East and Jehovah's Witnesses. They hate the cross. Yeah, there's a reason for that, so... All right, this is the end of chapter 3. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.